want to introduce you to our next speaker, Professor Howard, Howard Wynant. Howard Wynant, many of you are here for his class, um, is, as most of you know, a professor of sociology here at UCSB, where he's also affiliated with uh, Black Studies, Chicana and Chicano Studies, Asian American Studies departments. He founded and directed the UC Center for New Racial Studies. Wynant's research and writing focuses on racial theory and social theory, and comparative uh, historical sociology, political sociology, and cultural sociology of race, both in the US and globally. He is also currently working on a book on anti-racism and very excited to share his thoughts with you today. Thank you, Emily. Thank you uh, to uh, Ben and Sarah Mansky as well. Thanks to all of you for coming. Shout out to Soch One. <laughs> all right. Well, my talk was supposed to be called race, Racism and Anti-Racism, and I'm definitely going to get into that. But um, I've retitled it Disposable People. And I also want to talk about freedom struggles, this, the effort not to be disposable, the effort to resist being disposed of. We live in a society is dominated by wealth, as Gar Alperovitz has just demonstrated. It's an advanced capitalist society. Its, its wealth depends on plundering people, dispossessing people. In, in many ways in the US today, race and gender trump class. Yes, I said Trump. <laughs> it's a pun. Mm -hmm. It works, too. Both sides of it work. Racism and sexism built this system. I'm kind of reading you the screen here, but I don't think that's so bad in the audience this size. The racism that went along with the conquest of Native people, the destruction of the indigenous population, not only of North America, but of all the Americas. There went along the racism that emerged from that and that emerged from the enslavement of Africans shaped this system. Sexism, too, shaped it, as Simone de Beauvoir said, capitalism, Marxism, cannot deal with the existential othering of women. And it is not enough to think about, think about racism, it's not enough to think about capitalism and capitalist inequality as a source of racism. It goes deeper than that. We could use some of that same phrase, the existential othering of people of color to understand why in the United States particularly, one could argue about this in the rest of the world too, racism trumps capitalism. Race, race and gender Trump class. That's a provocative statement to say on the left, but I'm saying it. And the um, results of the current primaries in the Democratic Party, I think, are proving that, that race and gender are beating class, that Hillary is beating Bernie. That's not for no reason. It's very interesting to think why black voters in particular, the most astute, the most sophisticated, by far, voters in the United States are choosing Hillary over Bernie by margins of two or three to one. Why women 
again, some of the most sophisticated, some of the most sophisticated voters in the United States are choosing Hillary over Bernie. I love Bernie. Nothing against Bernie. But he's basically campaigning for the white working class vote. He's got good positions, but he is not addressing the deeper issues. And we have to think about why our leading black left um, theorists and activists, people like Cornel West, whom I've known for decades and decades and admire tremendously, how do they account for the fact that their strong support of Bernie is not accompanied by the masses of black voters in this country? Because race and gem gender trump class, because of that, if we want to think about the next system, we have to think about reparations. We have to think about the systematic plunder, the dispossession of half a millennium, over half a millennium, of black people in particular, but also other people of color. We need reparations for slavery. We need the unfettered right to abortion in this country. Unfettered. Abortion rights are democratic rights. Abortion rights are human rights. The right to control your own body is a bottom line for women in this country, but not just for women, for democracy itself. So without the stolen land, Without the stolen labor, without the stolen bodies, some of them white bodies, by the way, especially Irish, were enslaved or indentured, which is a form of, of, of sort of a slavery light in the founding of the United States. There would, without that, there would never have been Capitalism. There would never have been the accumulation of wealth needed to launch capitalism. It's the accumulation by dispossession, the accumulation through theft. In this way, I am echoing Marx and also modern Marxist David Harvey that created the capitalist system. Race and gender Trump class in the United States. But those aren't just concepts. Those are practices. Practices of cruelty, barbarity, and violence. Violence is central to American politics. The kind of grotesque cruelty and barbarity, that kind, does not happen without a great deal of violence. You couldn't have slavery. You couldn't have the subjugation of women. You couldn't have the assault on abortion rights without a tremendous amount of violence, especially state violence. That violence needs to be politically and culturally justified and legitimated, and it's done through racism and sexism. Racism and sexism, in short, come from greed. They come from what is basically, historically, white men's hunger for power. This isn't a guilt trip. This isn't something I'm trying to lay on every white man. There have been tremendous struggles against this that have included many millions of white men. And yet, it, it, there's a deep pattern here. And again, if you look at the 2016 election, you'll see that the most backward voting blocks in the country, often dispossessed and resentful, often with reason to be resentful, are white working class men. 
sure, greed, structural racism, institutional sexism are different now from what they were in the past. We have some sense of institutional and structural racism. We have less sense of institutional and structural sexism, the way we are bombarded from moment to moment with images of objectified, sexualized women there for taking. Look at our culture, look at your culture, and look at the structural racism and structural sexism, institutional sexism that is there, that funds, that finances, that structures our culture. In other words, whether you're buying and selling human flesh directly through slavery, or buying and selling it indirectly through advertising, through slum lording, through numerous other instances of, of greed, you're carrying on a similar tradition, the same tradition that has generated the crisis that exists in this country. Conservatism, what we call in this country conservatism is really, a better name for it is neoliberalism, but I'm not gonna go into that in a lot of detail here. I'll just tell you some of the th basic belief systems that are involved. It's the politics of greed. That's where, if the, if the concept of disposable people goes back to slavery and conquest, it also goes forward from there to the present. When you ask what makes someone disposable, the answer conservatives give, neoliberals give, is let the market decide. If you're not making enough money, you're disposable. And a lot of the political rhetoric that comes from the right, from conservatives and neoliberals, is about this greed. Why should I pay taxes so less deserving people can have good schools and good health care? Why should I care when Black Lives Matter is out on the street trying to save the lives of black youth? This is neoliberal rule. Cut back. Police more heavily. Let's hear it for the police. Let's hear it for state violence. Cut back on food stamps. They don't deserve that. Why should I pay for somebody else's food? They're not paying for mine. Drug test welfare recipients, they're just social parasites. This is conservative politics today, neoliberal politics in the United States today. The level of greed, the level of destructiveness, the level of um, disregard and disposability that is in, imposed on people who are not wealthy is truly staggering. If you're poor, it's your own fault. Poor and working people cost wealthier people money. Public schools, public universities, cut it all back. The corporatization, privatization of the university is staggering, of the public university is staggering in this country. Gar says when he went to the University of Wisconsin, he paid $90 a semester. Well, you know, if you look at the job listings at UCSB for faculty, there's almost no listings for English, sociology, history, philosophy, languages. The, the listings are all for corporate funded or corporate grant oriented uh, STEM fields. If you want to uh, 
If you want a job at UCSB, you should learn how to make titanium more heat resistant for General Electric's jet, jet engines. You'll get a job. So, what are poor people used for? useful for? They're useful for cheap labor. Labor in the fields, in construction, in fast food. Why should we pay them a living wage? Just cost us more money. They don't deserve it. And they're useful in prison, as laborers in prison. And prisons are useful for political reasons as well. Mass incarceration destroys millions of lives, not just the prisoners, but their families, their communities. Our culture as a whole is blighted by its punitive and violent characteristics. But prison pays off. It pays off economically because it's a source of cheap labor. Every major corporation in this country uses prison labor. And it pays off politically as social control. Keep those masses from objecting. Keep them from protesting. Keep them poor. Mitt Romney, running in 2012, talked about this. He thought he was speaking uh, in secret to his, uh, only to his supporters, but it came out, it was leaked. He said, 47% of the population are takers, not makers. Again, poor people are disposable people. Superfluous. Black and brown people are disposable people. Many women, too, and indeed many low-income whites, too. If we, have to, if we have to deny benefits to, like Medicaid, uh, health care for poor people, to white people, poor white people in, in places like Mississippi, in order to also deny benefits to black people, in Mississippi, we'll deny the white people, too. Good schools for them, decent health care for them, alternatives to prison for them. What's the point? It's just going to cost us makers taxes. That's what Mitt Romney was saying. This contempt for people, gotcha, this contempt for people who are not going to support themselves extends to public, public education at all levels. Higher education, too. What good is an English major? What good is a sociology major, a women's studies major, feminist studies here, an ethnic studies major? How are they going to help capitalism? How are they going to make money? Well, this shit ain't right. Let me talk for just a minute about the next system. I could go on with this for a long time, but what about that next system? First of all, it has to be get based on giving people a lot more respect and a lot more attention. Focusing on edu education, probably the main question is how we give attention to youth, respect and attention to our children and our youth. Repara reparations, abortion rights, and let me add comprehensive immigrants and rep refugee rights. These are primary, primary forms of respect for people of color and women. What would reparations involve? Massive investment in schools in health care, in the green economy, in the urban areas particularly, but also on reservations, also in poor rural areas. We need drastic cuts in the military-industrial complex. Uh, leading economist in, in our country, Nobel, Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz estimates the cost of the Iraq war as upwards of $3 trillion. 
You have to take a deep breath. Can't, we can't even wrap our heads around a figure like that. But what would three trillion dollars do to transform this culture, this economy, this political system of disposable people and greed? Respecting children and youth, as I say. We can start with schools. Youth, children are our most important people. You are our most important people. Every public school should be a community center. In poor neighborhoods, schools should offer kids breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Health care, clothing and shoes if they need it. You know that thousands of kids come to school hung hungry every day. 33% of, of all U.S. children live in poverty. The government says 20% or 25% do. That's an uh, uh, appalling figure in itself. But the government considers poverty in very narrow ways, has very poor measures of poverty. One third of the children in our country are poor. And we decry how bad our education system is when kids don't have enough to eat. When teachers are providing shoes for kids who come to school barefoot. Teachers must be honored and assisted, not degraded and abandoned. That's another for, form of, um, of greed and disposability. Let's privatize public education at all levels, not just the University of California, the University of Wisconsin, the University of Michigan, but K through 12. Let's make it charter schools. Those charter schools, privately owned and run, for the most part, take public money to offer, again, disposable people shitty education. We should forgive all student debt. Student debt is in the trillions of dollars in the United States. What a total scandal using our youth as a source of profit. Elizabeth Warren has been good on this. When Wall Street got itself into too much debt in 2008, that debt was paid by the US government, paid off. But student debt is insulated, it's even insulated from, when you, from going bankrupt. You can't go bankrupt on your student debt. This is just flat out greed, disposability of students, of people. We have the power, we have it in our power to reallocate wealth, invest in young people, increase our leisure through automation, through robotization of a great deal of work. It's possible to create much more free time, not only for children, but for adults to learn, to play, to deepen their knowledge and their cultural involvement, there can be a lot less toil and a lot more education and meaningful work. Of course, there will always be some toil. So let's give workers the respect and decent pay they deserve for childcare, for example. Give teachers the salaries they deserve. Give caregivers of elder, the elderly the pay they deserve. People want to work. There's so much work to be done. The country is falling apart. We need a much different approach to work. The green economy, as Van Jones has proposed, could be a massive source of employment as well as uplift of our economy as well, and in integration 
of the many disposable people who are out there. We have to pay a lot of attention to racism and anti-racism in order to do this work. We have to do much of it as a form of reparations. How do we get free? That's something Prince asked. I'm mourning Prince. What a genius he was. Very progressive, too. He had some slip-ups. Right? It was deeply respectful of women. You look at Prince's bands, they're full of women. You look at his lyrics. You look at his political activity. It was actually quite extensive. A mourning Prince. Well, there are big problems with everything I've said, of course. It's hard to imagine taking care of each other after years and years, decades, and even centuries of being taught to compete with each other, not to trust each other, to take advantage of each other. It's very hard to imagine a society that honors cooperation. It's very hard to imagine how we can learn to respect each other across racial lines and gender lines when we've been taught so deeply, so comprehensively to mistrust and dislike and fear each other. Male fear of women is huge. White fear of people of color is very large. What if they do to us what we have done to them? That's the unconscious subtext. But everywhere in our lives, in our schools, in our political life, in our economic life, in our culture, as Gaurav Palafid is saying too, the seeds are there for an alternative way of getting free, as Prince once said as well. So. Let's pick up that challenge. Thank you very much.